Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and once again, welcome to the Funk Chronicles. I'm your host, Dr. Turk Logan from Logan Communications and the Funk Museum Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center. I am very, very, very honored today to have as my special guest, Commissioner Jeffrey Mims, Jr. How you doing? Commissioner, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing real good. I'm well. Doing You're the newest good. commissioner on the city of Dayton, and, and what, after having a, an illustrious career in education here in Dayton, Ohio, what made you run for the city commission? Well, it gave me another opportunity to, to work with and help people. Right. Yeah, you know, which has been my passion. Having been in education for some 35 years prior to that, a lot of the young people that I had in different classrooms across the city and in my soccer team and track team, Botillion, are now adults. Right. So it still gives me the opportunity to further that whole educational process with them and help continue the movement to improve the quality of life for all the citizens in Dayton. Well, you've so, been a community service that's my, person. That's, that's my passion. In, in the community for yeah. as long as I've known you. And how, how did it give me a little bit about your educational background and um, from, from grade school right on through college? Well, you only start as a kindergartner. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I'm okay. sure you can. You know, you know, kindergartner through fifth grade, Dayton Public Schools. Uh, Jefferson Township schools from uh, sixth grade on to so graduation. So you and Ricky Poo went to school. Oh together. yeah, okay. I mean we go we go way back. Me right. and me and Rick were in the Boy Scouts together. He's a year ahead of me. One of my other um, uh, classmates at the time, Dean Lovelace, uh, both of them a year ahead of me. And Dean, of course, as you know, is uh, my colleague on the city commission. Sure, he is. Yeah, very esteemed, uh, very accomplished, a great leader in so many many things that involve helping people. Right. The, the whole issue with predatory lending and, you know, all these issues that he's been involved with. Sure, sure. In terms of foreclosure, he was involved with those things before they hit national headlines. I remember. So, I remember. And we were all in the Boy Scouts together. Okay. Uh, so uh, that good Jefferson training, I got my musical start, I should say, also in, uh, in Dayton Public Schools as I moved uh, from the fourth grade a teacher who convinced me uh, to go to this concert at Memorial Hall, and there was a drummer there who was just 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 wearing them out. And I looked at that, I so I began to beat on tables and things of that nature. Sure. And then that that developed further when I went to Jefferson, being in the band, the American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps. Uh, what instrument did you play? I'm a drummer. Drummer. Okay. Drummer. Okay. Um, Played with uh, Satch when he was our leader. Before he went with the Ohio Players and Ohio Untouchables, he was our lead saxophonist with the uh, Artists of Music. Sad enough. Uh, yeah. So so play played with him in that group. A guy by the name of Hong Kong Jones. Okay. Uh, who played the bass? Little Skip, lead oh, no, guitar. Right, right. Uh, some early experiences then with uh, with Don Hubbard. Another guy by the name of Foster who played. Uh, uh, the organ. Okay. You know, at that time, of course, organs were big and the speakers were B3, even, were big e old B3. Even, even bigger. Yeah, so, yeah, you, know, yeah, you, yeah. Need, you needed a trailer to carry things as you went from place to place. I understand. I remember yeah. those days. So, so then, in terms of finishing uh, Jefferson, being in the band, uh, leader of the American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps uh, with the Pythagoreans and also with, uh, with jun Junior Masons, uh, graduated, went to the military. Uh, served a year in Vietnam and 604th Air Commando Squadron, came back. And while I was in the military, I guess while I was stationed in New Jersey, participated in... Fort Dix? Uh, no, I was in McGuire. Oh, you were in the yeah, Air yeah, Force? Yeah, Air Force. Yeah. I was in the Army yeah, at yeah. Fort Dix, okay. So they, they had this national military talent contest that they had every year. Okay. And I participated and won the worldwide talent contest as the instrumental soloist, the okay. drummer, in okay. 1967. Okay. And the, in fact, the world uh, finals were here at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Okay. Okay. So, um, even though I had a lot of success in terms of music, and had gotten a music scholarship uh, while I was in the military, okay, I came out and decided that I wanted to do something else 
in terms of going to college and getting involved in graphics and industrial right. technology, which my primary major was right. in, uh, was talked into a program to work as a teacher's aide in the Dayton school system where they were trying to get ex uh, military people, veterans, and community members right. to just increase the male and minority participation in the school system. Okay. And so, along with myself, there were several guys like William Schooler, Doug Jeffries, Bobby guys. Collier, those guys. So, we are part of this movement with uh, Model Cities right. to go through an educational process at Central State University where they paid a significant amount of the fees, plus, they paid us a salary. And so we came into the school system as a teacher's aide, and then as a substitute teacher for just a brief minute. I think I served for about a day and they made me a permanent teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and actually, it was a hard decision because I was supposed to be working for General Motors designing cars. Okay. Uh, but I got hooked once I started working with young people in education. Okay. And, and, and pretty much stayed there. So, difference uh, in salary, I'm uh, sure. Uh, significant difference. <laughs> I'm significant sure. difference in terms of that. From from that point, working uh, as a teacher and a coach in the Dayton school system, evolved to try to find ways to make education better, to make the system better. I was elected treasurer, then vice president, and then president of the teachers union, and to carry on that situation again, again, just trying to improve the overall uh, conditions for education to take place. Right. And first for the students, second for the people who are working with students, and then for the people who are working with the people who are working with students. Well, I tell you, that's and, the community, that's right. And so it's just been a continuing pathway. Now you were president of the school board, right? Uh, yes, sir. President of the school board, um, 08 through, I guess, 010 mm -hmm. uh, and 11. And then uh, served on the state school board right. for three years. Okay until I remember that yeah, transition yeah so so then I was I was asked and pushed in the position to run for the Dayton City Commission and so people say well what are you going to do when you grow up I yeah, said well really. well basically I'm not really sure right we're never going to grow yeah. up we're yeah. just going to have a great time right. doing what we're right. doing right. Now. the issue yeah. and, and that's it bottom line right. I, I've really been blessed in having to work with so many many great people along the way and doing so many different things I've had great mentors who have worked with me. I go back to, again, I was talking about Dean Lovelace and Ricky Poole. Right. We had this uh, scout leader by the name of Mr. Ewing Diggs. Right. And he was just a tremendous father figure, even though we had fathers who were active in our lives, there were some young people who did not. Sure. But the kind of mentorship we got from 60s, him, right? this was in the 60s. Right. Uh, the issue with the American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps had people like Mrs. Watts, a uh, gentleman by the name of Mr. Hayden and uh, Mr. Nooks. My boy scout uh, pack leader was yeah. Mr. Payne. So, okay, uh, right. Right. So when you go back and you look at your coaches, you look at your advisors and your other mentors, and uh, I remember Mr. Shepard, Mr. James Shepard, whose son I knew, Bobby Shepard, was a singer with the group that I called, that I mentioned before, the Artists of Music. Right, right. And Mr. Shepard was the supervisor of the usher board, uh, junior usher board at uh, St. Luke Baptist Church where I participated as well in terms of doing that. So my life has been enriched with so many mentors and volunteers that have done so many things to help young people and we stand on their shoulders. Every time we're doing something we stand on their shoulders because of what they've done for us. I was just talking to um, a gentleman in Denver and, and um, a person that you know very, very well, Bing Davis here oh, in Dayton, yes. Ohio. Yes. I did a music project with him um, last year, and part of that was they sent me out from the Schuster Center to talk to some kids at Fairmont um, High School. Okay. And I walked into the building, and there were 15 white kids, nobody mm -hmm. black, 15, mm -hmm. not, not that that makes a difference because mm -hmm. it really doesn't. And I looked around, and I said, man, I've been here before. Yeah. They looked at me and we don't know you, Dr. Logan. <laughs> I sit on their board, their advisory board, because they have a carrier current radio station. Okay. Fifteen years ago. And when I was at WCSU at Central State. And everything looked the same, so it was like a deja vu. And we kept their radio station call letters on the air 
when the kids were out of school in the summer. We'd say okay. W W C S U and W K E F. I believe that was the radio station. And it was just we. I had the opportunity to talk to these youngsters about black music for three hours, mm -hmm. and they recorded the whole thing. And it was the, one of the most beautiful experiences that I've had with youngsters the, in, in, in years since I left Central State University. Okay. Now, these are, high, these are high school kids at Central State. They were college kids. Mm -hmm. And um, they recorded it and wrote about it. There were articles in the paper and whatnot. And, and these kids were really into the black music. I, at, at that time, we weren't directly involved in the Funk Museum Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center. So I understand and um, honor you for being so involved into education because I know your background, I know your history, and I know mm -hmm. what you've been doing, and you're mm -hmm. very good at what you do, and you're recognized yeah. probably nationally for, for, for what you've done, especially when you went to the state school board. What's your vision for the city of Dayton as you see uh, as, as a city commissioner, as city father? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, it, it, it all falls under the large umbrella of improving the quality of life for the citizens of Dayton. And when you look at that, that big umbrella, and you say to those young people and those who are um, uh, trying to be old, and then those of us who got a little, uh, some people say, long in the tooth, Right. You know, short on hair, long in the tooth. Right, okay? right, 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 right. I, I really would like for the citizens of Dayton to have some of the same quality of life opportunities that they have in Centerville and Oakwood and Kettering. Sure. And so I can say that very uh, uh, s sincerely. Yeah. Uh, and and, that, and as openly, I compare yeah. and openly the same thing as far as uh, Dayton is concerned uh, for the students. I'd say in terms of the school system, I want our children in Dayton Public Schools and all the charters or where the schools we have in the city because we have to network together to make things happen. The divisiveness has hurt us. Right. If we look at the goal of, again, improving the quality of life through education for all of our citizens and our young people, it gives us something that we can all focus on. So then we look at how we make those things happen. Right. So we look at jobs, okay, what kind of things increase the opportunity for jobs. We have to bring more businesses into the city of Dayton. Okay. And they have to do more hiring of citizens of Dayton throughout the community to right. have more local and minority workers. Sure. And to attract businesses from across the nation to come into the city and to do the best they can to increase our tax base, to increase the population base, and also to increase the diversity and help us move the whole quality of life spectrum and that needle as high as we can. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at a meeting earlier today in Westchester where the uh, mayor, uh, Mayor Nan Willie, was, in, uh, was one of the keynote speakers, along, mayor of Dayton, right? mayor Dayton right. along with the vice mayor for Cincinnati talking about this whole regionalization process of things that we can do and have to do together. And as we move further and further south and as Cincinnati and their citizens and programs move further and further north, pretty soon we're going to be more connected than what we are. Sure. Uh, also involved in those meetings were individuals uh, along city government from some of the areas of, uh, of Westchester, of Mason, and Lebanon, who also were looking at ways that we can partner together to try to make some things happen so we can grow the region and make this whole region, including the hubs, Cincinnati and Dayton, uh, grow and sparkle the way it should be. And again, bottom line, creating high quality of life opportunities for every citizen that we have. That's, that, that's superb. And I'm sure uh, in your lifetime you'll make those things yep. happen because I know you're dedicated and, 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 and it's good to talk about yep. your vision. Yep. And, and, and we looked at some roadblocks, things that we had that we looked at. Of course, they mentioned schools. It's one of those from an educational perspective. Uh, we looked at minority um, workers. We looked at situations where we have a major challenge with our young men of color. Right. And I know I'm leading the initiative in the city for men of color to increase opportunities for our young people to help them connect the dots right. between youthhood and adulthood. Uh, the commission, along with the mayor leading this whole project with the city of Dayton, school district, and right. superintendent, Lori Ward, 
we've gotten a lot of support from our businesses on this whole City of Learners initiative right. to increase the educational capital of all the young people that we have in Dayton, which then attracts more and more businesses to want to come, bring their families, bring their workers, and take benefit in all the types of things that we have going on here. Well, you so know, it's all connected. You, you, you hit the nail on the head because they, the, the men of color, like you said, young men of color, need a mentor like you. You know, I know one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Arthur Edward Thomas, yep. former president yep. of Central State yep. University, he's on the Tom Joyner cruise right now. Yeah, <laughs> very, very, very motivational. Education. Very motivational. Yep. Yep. And when I was 17 years, 16, 17 years old, he was standing out on the street corner, dashiki afro, mm -hmm. hand in the air, and power is education. Black yep. power is education. Yep. And I bought into that. And now it's 50 plus years later. <laughs> and I'm still buying into that. And he's still saying the same thing. And so, and, and, and you came up in that era as, mm -hmm. as well. Right. And, and Art is still involved. I mean, I would get emails from him uh, uh, still. Uh, trying to help different people. That's right. Send you a resume of someone, see if you can check this person out or help this person do this and help this person do that. And his words don't just come empty. 77 uh, years old right. in June. And, and <laughs> whenever I was running for any campaign, I could always count on him to send a contrib contribution. That's right. You know, what's your email address, what's, you know, whatever, you know, so we can send you something. He's been very dedicated over so. the, the many, many years. And, and, and like I said, uh, he is the reason that I ended up at Central State University and had a great time there for 23 years. He yeah. is the reason I went back to school to work on my doctorate because, okay. you know, he preaches education. So, um, and, 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 and I know you guys have been close over the years and, 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 and right. we share some of the same values. I think we're in that same fraternity as well. Aren't we're in that same fraternity <laughs> as well. Yeah, well, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We're in that Achievement, same. every field of human endeavor. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah. You have just been appointed to uh, one of our uh, committees as National Education Director of the Funk Museum Hall of Fame and Education. And um, what is your vision for that? Well, you know, um, when I tell people a lot of the things that uh, uh, we've experienced over the years, and you know, playing in bands, knowing a lot of the young people who also grew up playing in bands, uh, in 77, I recall that seven of the top ten records, I'm talking about top ten records in the nation, were from bands in Dayton, from Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. This is in 1977. And, and I mean, individuals doubt that they can go and check it. Now you can get phenomenal, wasn't it? Yeah, email, <laughs> whatever, whatever. And when you look at Sun, Daz, Heat Wave, the Howl Players, you look at all those different groups that originated in Dayton. And then you had the spinoffs of those groups. And I recall, uh, of course, Keith Harrison was with, uh, uh, with a couple of bands. Fazo. Fazo. Heat Wave. Yeah, Heat Wave. His older brother and I played uh, drum duets. Right. And we won every talent contest in Dayton three times. There you go. That's and how I do that. It was yeah. like we go to the talent contest, people look up and see us, and then their discussion started about who was going to be second. Because first, they knew it was a given. But the issue was that it was not only just good for us. We had so many young people because his younger brother, Keith, then we had uh, Stan, uh, Paul Brooks, right, right. and those guys, they were neighbors. They lived, kids lived down the street. So as we were practicing, you know, throughout the week in different times in my garage, you know, we just garage door up, had the two cars garage, garage band. and we had a yeah, yeah. band there playing. Right, right, right. All the kids in the neighborhood would come over and they just watch. Right. So this was inspiration so you already for had them. Right. right. So this was inspiration for them about what they could do in sure, terms sure. of uh, in terms of music and in terms of their contribution to society using their different talents. So when you think about this this Hall of Fame, this whole educational perspective, we know by looking at research those individuals who are involved in extracurricular activities, and we talk about music, art, athletics, debate team, newspaper staff, yearbook staff, et cetera, et cetera, you can go on and on. All those extra things, the young people who have been involved in those things have 
been able to make the biggest contribution to society. Right. In fact, research says that 94% of the nation's CEOs from the Fortune 500 companies all participated in music, art, extracurricular activities from elementary school through college. That's right. Music is therapeutic. So, right. So when we look at issues, and I, I was telling some gentlemen earlier, as I, I've mentioned before, um, had a real challenge in, in, in the sixth grade in terms of a teacher who uh, had some, some problems with me. Now, of course, I created some of the problems. I was not the most uh, obedient all the time. All the time. Fortunately, I had a strong academic foundation and background, right. but I think the academic background was fostered by my, my, uh, my talents in music and sure. talents in art. Sure. Because by being a musician, I was able to read because I used the same skills. I was able to do math and fractions and half notes and, you know, because they're all associated with half sure, notes and sure, quarter sure, notes, et sure, cetera, et cetera. Sure. But being, uh, I won't go as far as say a borderline social deviant as far as school was concerned, but this teacher tried to put me in special ed. <laughs> and that effort caused me to be tested. And the superintendent, I recall hearing him say, hell, we can't put him in special ed. He's gifted. Now, I attribute the, the gifts that I had to the background and the experiences that I had in music and art right. and athletics and right. the extra mentors that I had throughout life, especially those younger, uh, younger time frames, sure, sure, sure. to help me get past some of the hurdles. So we talk about why are these things important educationally? Well, clearly, the earlier you plant the seed of self-value with a young person, that's right. the earlier you plant it, the better off they're going to be and the better off society is going to be. Right. We do not have the right to limit their talent pool, if you will, to just reading, writing, math, or science. Right. All of us have some God-given talents that we were born with. That's right. And God-given talents. As, a, as adults, we have the responsibility to help those children identify and nurture those talents and then use those talents for the betterment of society. So if it's dancing, if it's music, if it's your skills in science, if it's your, your great skills in speaking, those are talents that we have that we all have the responsibility of developing. Sure, sure. So as we narrow, unfortunately, the educational curriculum, we do our children more harm, we do our society more harm than good. Right. We do the world more harm than good. Because music and art has been an international type of language and an international way of communicating and an international way of valuing each other's cultures. That's true. Well, you know, speaking of education, uh, my father was president of the Dunbar class of 1943. Okay. My father was valedictorian. Okay. And my father made it sure he put his foot in my rear end every day <laughs> about education yeah. before I could go out and play and study my, mm -hmm. my math and my reading and my English and, mm -hmm. and, and my spelling. And I mean, you know, I'm talking from the second grade and I lost him when I was in the fourth grade to lung mm -hmm. cancer mm -hmm. and in 1959. And, I, and you know, you talk about your teachers, I had to leave St. John's Catholic School in 1959 and integrate Residence Park. Okay. And my life went straight down the tubes. Mm. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, being the yeah, only black yeah, yeah. in Residence Park in the fifth grade, mm. you you know what I went through yep, yeah, during I that time. It. But I, I, I built a constitution that I was going to follow in my father's footsteps, even though I only had him for a short period of time. His class of 1943, when they had their 60th year reunion in 2003, he had been dead for over 50 years. Okay. They called me in because I'm John Charles Logan Jr. Mm -hmm. to stand in for my father. And these people would have been my grandparents. Quite an honor. Oh man, I'm telling you, they gave yeah, me pictures, they gave me pictures of my family that my family didn't have, that mm -hmm. they kept of their class president for over 60 years. Okay. And you're talking about tears, man. And yeah. I still had them pictures today, and they talked about their class. That's the effect that my father had on them 
when mm -hmm. he was in high school, right here in Dayton, Ohio, okay. at Dunbar High School. And I tried to carry on his legacy, even though it was short-lived, mm -hmm. from the standpoint <clears throat> of what he brought to the table during his time here on Earth. And it is important. We've got about two minutes, Commissioner. We're talking to Commissioner Jeffrey Mims here on the Funk Chronicles, and it's an honor to talk to Commissioner Mims because he's one of our city fathers, and he gives direction to the city of Dayton, Ohio. Um, how important is it for us to have this museum here in Dayton, Ohio? We, we you know it's extremely important. As, as we look, and I mentioned before uh, some of my city commissioners, I want to make sure that uh, everyone understands, you know, with, with Nan Miller, uh, as mayor, uh, Joey Williams, one of my former students is as mayor. You know, I found that well. out. I had him okay. on the show, and, <laughs> yeah. and I, I said, okay. "Well, <laughs> Commissioner Mims is the is the new member." He said, "Not quite." He said, he's the, "I had he was one of my teachers." I said, "Okay." Yeah, okay. And, uh, and and Matt Joseph, and of course uh, Dean Lovelace. Right. You know, we have a tremendous team, and, and that team is all focused on trying to find ways to improve the quality of life for citizens of Dayton, as right. I as I mentioned before. Very supportive in terms of looking for ways, again, that we can bring employers, businesses, companies, improve the quality of life in our uh, respective neighborhoods throughout Dayton, have some of the, the, uh, the dollars that we're investing in downtown Dayton funnel out throughout the entire region, and especially throughout our entire community in terms of what we're doing. So when we talk about the Funk Museum, I think we're talking about something that's very, very natural sure. in terms of a resource, a, a, a significant group of individuals who had such great talent right. and that this community helped foster that talent to take them on to worldwide recognition. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So when we value each other's contributions <coughs> in our city, it makes the city richer. Right. And when other individuals see how we treat those who have made contributions to Dayton. It makes them want to participate. It makes them want to stand. And we're doing some great things in terms of uh, some recognition we got right. uh, nationally because of our immigration process that we're sure, doing. Some sure. of those things that are led by uh, Commissioner Matt Joseph. Right. So we're doing some things that I think really, really help to put Dayton on the map, even more so than where we are right now. Well, With this whole peace accord, you all know, kinds of great things. We can sit here and talk all day, and, 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 and it, it's such an honor to have you here. And keep doing what you do, mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep following you and, and keep making yeah. sure that, that, that we're all on track. And yeah. thank you for joining us no, here. No, my, my pleasure. Hey thank man, you. My brother. Thank okay. you for joining us. And thank us. the listening audience for watching. That's right. right. We've had a great time with our newest city commissioner, Jeffrey Mims, Jr., right here on the Fun Chronicles. I'm your host, Dr. Turk Logan. Thank you for joining us. Wow, 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 wow.